Everything you know about marketing is wrong. Everything you ever heard, everything you ever tried, and everything you've ever done, it's all wrong. What I want to do in this short presentation is teach you a system for marketing your business to a point where it becomes instantly obvious to your prospects that they would be an idiot to do business with anyone other than you at any time, anywhere, or at any price. For example, let's say you're a chiropractor and you've just spent more than $10,000 on radio advertising. You spent an entire weekend with an audio crew in your office, interviewing your staff, explaining your facility, and getting the entire production just right for prime time over the airwaves. And after all that work, if effort and expense, you ran the ads for several weeks. Your phone rang only 15 times. And those ads resulted in producing just one single patient at $1,900. How would you feel after investing $10,000 and winding up with a net loss of $8,100? You will never get back. Not to mention all the time, effort, and energy you wasted. But let me ask you this. What if you could take just 1300 of that marketing budget and just by changing what your radio ad says, instead of getting just 15 calls resulting in only one sale, you could generate 137 calls. Close 37 of those calls into brand new paying patients, each worth an average of $2,500 and you pocket a cool $92,500 for your trouble. That's what's called getting more results, making more money for the same time, the same money and the same effort spent. What if we could systematically do this for you? Let me show you how to leverage what you're already doing and how you too can get those exact same results for your business just by changing the way you do all of your marketing and advertising. And I'm not talking about radical changes, just simple common sense changes that enable you to exponentially leverage your marketing's results. That $10,000 marketing budget the chiropractor was spending remained the same whether they were getting 15 calls or 137 calls. And I'm going to share with you exactly how you can accomplish these same results with your marketing and in the process dominate your entire industry. In this short presentation I'm going to teach you how to achieve massive leverage with your marketing meaning simply that you'll make more money for the same time, the same money and the same effort you're expending right now. Why will this enable you to dominate your local market? Simple. Most businesses simply don't know how to do this. They don't understand the tremendous untapped potential that lies within their marketing. Most businesses today spend some money on marketing and advertising and then decide that whatever results they get from that marketing is probably about as good as it's going to get. They realize that the results can fluctuate up and down, but they never imagine that results like the chiropractor where they got 137 calls instead of 15 is even remotely possible. I'm here to tell you point blank that nothing could be further from the truth. The marketing system I'm going to teach you today is based on unchanging principles of human nature that dictate that people always want to make the best buying decision possible. And therefore, marketing's job, your job, is not to yak incessantly about how great you are or how low your prices are. Your job is to position your prospective buyers so they have total control over the decision making process. Based on them having enough quantity and quality of information to determine that they're receiving the most value for the price they pay. The system I'm going to teach you is truly a breakthrough in marketing and advertising, yet it's simple and easy to understand. We have thousands of client successes to prove that this works literally every time it's implemented properly, regardless of what business or industry you're in. I'm going to introduce you to some very common sense principles of marketing that you'll be able to instantly validate and embrace. Principles that will give you a clear vision of what your marketing is supposed to look like and, just as importantly, what it's not supposed to look like. I want to show you the fundamental formulas and strategies to not only make your marketing work better, but to enable you to create what we call competition crushing marketing. I want you to see how powerful all of this is, allow you to comprehend what the possibilities are for your business and what a significant advantage you'll hold over your competitors when you implement it. So let's get started. There are two main components to any marketing plan, strategic marketing and tactical marketing. Strategic marketing is the content of your message. It's what you say and how you say it. It's including the concept that you choose to focus on, the words and images you use to communicate those concepts, and the tone in which the message is delivered. Tactical marketing, on the other hand, has to do with the execution of the strategic marketing, such as placing ads, building a website, attending trade shows, and things like that. If I ask a business owner about their marketing plan, the answer almost always comes back in terms of tactical marketing. They send direct mail, run radio ads, create a website, you know, those kinds of things. But the key to effective marketing is to master the strategic side, not the tactical. What you say in your marketing and how you say it are almost always more important than the marketing medium where you say it. 
Both are important, of course, but the real leverage is in the messaging itself, and that's the strategic side of marketing. In fact, when a marketing campaign bombs, the tendency is almost always to blame the marketing medium, like the TV or radio station, which is the tactical part of the plan. Without any regard to how good or bad the strategy behind the marketing piece was. During this presentation, you'll learn how to say things in a way that will make a profound difference in your marketing results. This system has been successfully implemented in over 400 different industries, including business coaches, social media consultants, contractors, business brokers, accountants, financial companies, retail stores, real estate companies, home builders, restaurants, software companies, doctors, dentists, remodelers, internet companies, manufacturing companies, and anything and everything else you can think of. We've even used it to help a $10 per hour dog walker build his business to over half a million dollars. Our revolutionary new lead generation system works with all sizes of businesses, from startups clear up to Fortune 500 companies. But our true passion lies in working with small businesses, averaging about $2 million in revenue and below. This system will let you finally quit competing on price and start selling your product or service for what you're really worth. You'll drive in more leads and often see an increase in your advertising response by two to more than 100 times. You'll also convert a higher percentage of those leads and make your salespeople into superstars. You'll increase the amount of your average sale and your list of clients that pay, stay, and refer will increase significantly. In short, you'll get a bigger bang for your marketing buck. But maybe best of all, you will finally have total control over your marketing and lead generation results. So let me ask you one simple question. What is the actual purpose of marketing? I mean, what is marketing really supposed to do? Well, in a nutshell, marketing is supposed to help facilitate your prospect's decision-making process. There are prospects out there that need to buy what you sell. Sometimes they need to be educated to the fact that they need to buy what you sell in the first place. At other times, they already know that they want it, but they need help deciding who they should buy it from. Often, they think they might want what you sell, but they have questions and concerns that need to be overcome before they'll pull out their credit card or checkbook. But consider this. Because these prospects are not experts in what you do, or their exposure to what you sell is quite low, they don't really know the relevant issues surrounding the purchase. They don't know how to make the best decision. They can't tell the difference between the best deal and a major mistake which leaves an opportunity for you to provide them with this information and then guide them through the buying process. Consider this example. Throughout your life, how many sunrooms have you ever bought? Have you bought five, two, one, or like 99% of homeowners, zero? Let's assume you fall into that group of 99% of people who have never bought a sunroom before. Do you have any idea whatsoever how to buy a sunroom? Can you tell the difference between a $10,000 sunroom and a $25,000 one just by looking at it? Of course you can't. Now, realize that when people need to buy what you sell, they are generally speaking just as clueless about what you're selling as you are about sunrooms. So your job, simply put, is to facilitate your prospect's decision-making process. Listen, this is actually pretty simple. All prospects and customers want the exact same things. And it really doesn't matter what type of business you have. They want to feel confident that their money has been well spent and that their decision has been made to the best of their ability. They want to get the best deal, not the best price, but the best deal in terms of overall value. People instinctively want to make the best decision possible and not feel like they've got to second guess their buying decision. All you have to do as the marketer is figure out what's important to your prospects. Educate them as to what constitutes the best deal when it comes to buying what you sell. Remember, value, and then show them quantifiable proof that you actually provide the best deal in terms of price and value. All this has to be communicated to them in a way they'll pay attention to, believe in, and then take action on. When this occurs, the prospect gets what they really want from you. Complete confidence that they have actually made the best decision possible and that they have truly gotten the best value. But here's the problem. Instead of using marketing to educate and facilitate the decision-making process and build the case why a product or service is the best on the market, most businesses fill their marketing with self-serving jargon. That's only a thinly veiled way to say, buy it from me because I want you to give me the money instead of my competitor. That's why people become jaded and why they resist marketing. They tend to either dismiss your entire marketing message or worse, they become skeptical and stop paying attention to the message altogether. Prospective buyers want and need to be educated so that they can feel confident when making their purchase decision. And no one's providing it. But here's the good news. The first one who does provide prospects with this information wins all the most profitable customers available. 
When marketing is done improperly, the end result is 100% predictable. You start to feel intense pricing pressure from your prospects. And typically, you're forced to cave in, lower your prices, destroy your margins, and make way less money than you should just to stay competitive. And you get to spend more time at work and away from your family than those that are successful. Here's the brutal truth, and please don't be offended by this, but if you're always competing on price, it's your own fault. Your lack of marketing ability has led to a situation where there's no discernible difference between you and your competition. There have been no additional parameters or relevant issues introduced to educate your prospects as to what really constitutes the best value when it comes to buying what you sell. If you feel like you're always competing on price, it's because price is the only relevant variable that you've given your prospects to consider. From the prospect's perspective, all things appear equal, so they default to the business offering the lowest price. I'm about to show you how to fix that once and for all. Our system, simply put, is a step-by-step -step program for innovating and marketing your business. The system will allow you to first be better than the competition, and then second, do better marketing than your competition. This allows you to separate your business from your competition and become the obvious choice for your prospects to do business with. Consider this. There are actually two sides to your business. First, there's what I call the inside reality, and second, what I call the outside perception. The inside reality encompasses everything you do and everything that makes your business great. It's all of your skills, the people who work for you, your expertise, the way you service your customers before, during, and after the sale. It's your systems, your operational procedures, your commitment to excellence. It's your passion and the way you conduct your business on a daily basis. Add these all together and they equal your value to the marketplace. And that's what I call the inside reality. So how's your inside reality? If you ask your customers why they buy from you, they could probably tell you something quantifiable, specific and instantly obvious. They could point to specific benefits they enjoy when doing business with you. Then they would say things like, that's why I do business here. That's why I refer my friends to come here. And that's why I'm a loyal customer. That's why I'm willing to pay more here and why I keep coming back. That's your inside reality. So your inside reality is all about what you do and what you are that allows you to perform better. However, your outside perception has to do with how customers and prospects perceive your company. The outside dismiss your entire marketing message or worse they become skeptical and stop paying attention to the message altogether prospective buyers want and need to be educated so that they can feel confident when making their purchase decision and no one's providing it but here's the good news the first one who does provide prospects with this information wins all the most profitable customers available when marketing is done improperly the end result is 100 percent predictable you start to feel intense pricing pressure from your prospects and typically you're forced to cave in lower your prices destroy your margins and make way less money than you should just to stay competitive and you get to spend more time at work and away from your family than those that are successful here's the brutal truth and please don't be offended by this but if you're always competing on price it's your own fault 
Your lack of marketing ability has led to a situation where there is no discernible difference between you and your competition. There have been no additional parameters or relevant issues introduced to educate your prospects as to what really constitutes the best value when it comes to buying what you sell. If you feel like you're always competing on price, it's because price is the only relevant variable that you've given your prospects to consider. From the prospect's perspective, all things appear equal, so they default to the business offering the lowest price. I'm about to show you how to fix that once and for all. Our system, simply put, is a step-by-step -step program for innovating and marketing your business. The system will allow you to first be better than the competition and then second do better marketing than your competition. This allows you to separate your business from your competition and become the obvious choice for your prospects to do business with. Consider this. There are actually two sides to your business. First, there's what I call the inside reality and second, what I call the outside perception. The inside reality encompasses everything you do and everything that makes your business great. It's all of your skills, the people who work for you, your expertise, the way you service your customers before, during, and after the sale. It's your systems, your operational procedures, your commitment to excellence. It's your passion and the way you conduct your business on a daily basis. Add these all together and they equal your value to the marketplace. And that's what I call the inside reality. So how's your inside reality? If you ask your customers why they buy from you, they could probably tell you something quantifiable, specific and instantly obvious. They could point to specific benefits they enjoy when doing business with you. Then they would say things like, that's why I do business here. That's why I refer my friends to come here. And that's why I'm a loyal customer. That's why I'm willing to pay more here and why I keep coming back. That's your inside reality. So your inside reality is all about what you do and what you are that allows you to perform better. However, your outside perception has to do with how customers and prospects perceive your company. It matters to your prospects all together and they equal your value to the marketplace. And that's what I call the inside reality. So how's your inside reality? If you ask your customers why they buy from you, they could probably tell you something quantifiable, specific and instantly obvious. They could point to specific benefits they enjoy when doing business with you. Then they would say things like, that's why I do business here. That's why I refer my friends to come here. And that's why I'm a loyal customer. That's why I'm willing to pay more here and why I keep coming back. That's your inside reality. So your inside reality is all about what you do and what you are that allows you to perform better. However, your outside perception has to do with how customers and prospects perceive your company. The outside perception is developed through the interactions that your prospects and customers have with your business. Your customers will draw on their past buying experiences with you to form the outside perception of your business. But here's the problem. If you provide unmatched and unequaled customer service and your customers absolutely love you, none of that matters to your prospects if, number one, they don't even know you exist as an option, or number two, they see your marketing and advertising and because of your inability to market your business properly, their perception is that you're no different or no better or no worse than your competitors. I would estimate that well over 95% of all businesses are completely inept when it comes to marketing. And the end result is that your inside reality and your outside perception are perceived to be different. You see, regardless of how good you are, regardless of your inside reality, your prospect isn't going to be able to figure out your true inside reality based on your marketing. You simply appear to be just another business that sells whatever it is that you sell and don't say, well, that's okay because I have a salesperson and when they get in front of my prospects, they'll be able to educate them and close the sale. Listen, that's a great theory. But I can flat guarantee that even your best salesperson is never going to close a prospect who doesn't know you exist and therefore never bothers to contact you in the first place. Remember the chiropractor? 137 calls versus 15 calls. That's an extra 122 calls per month. People who are not calling this chiropractor prior to changing his marketing. How can you close people you never contact you? Obviously you can't. That's why your marketing must do the heavy lifting for you. Let your marketing deliver eager, qualified prospects to your sales funnel. But here's even worse news. Competition today is more fierce now than it's ever been. How many competitors do you have right now in your business? Because that's how many choices your prospects have. And that's how many additional businesses they have to sift through and filter through as they attempt to reach a buying decision. And by the way, the internet has only made the problem worse. Have you noticed lately that everyone's going bonkers for online marketing? SEO, pay-per-click, Facebook, social marketing, and rightfully so. Most prospects are so busy these days that most of them start their buying process by researching online. 
But here's the sad reality for businesses that are advertising online. They spend a ton of their time and a ton of their effort and money just to get prospects to their website. And guess what their prospects see when they get there? The same old lame junk like service, quality, and dependability that they saw in their lame brochure before the internet was invented, as well as the same lame junk that all their competitors have on their websites. These businesses then curse their high bounce rate, and they try to figure out how to get better qualified traffic to visit their site. The reality is that they're probably already getting enough qualified traffic to their site, but they fail to realize that it's their lame website that's not converting their prospect. That's the real problem. Everyone looks at the internet as the end-all be-all to all of their marketing problems. But the reality is that the internet is just another medium to screw up your marketing with bland messages that do not facilitate the decision-making process of your prospects. Yes, the internet is an important tool in your marketing arsenal, but you need to have a great website. And that means you better fix your strategic messaging that I've been talking about or you're going to fail. There's an old saying that goes like this. If you want to know why Jane Doe buys what Jane Doe buys, you've got to see the world through Jane Doe's eyes. But the problem is that while most businesses are very good at knowing what Jane Doe wants because they aren't communicating communication experts, they don't have the ability to communicate through their advertising and marketing their inside reality to the outside world. They can't lead their prospects to say, I would be an idiot to do business with anyone other than you at any time, anywhere, or at any price. We've been successfully generating leads for business owners now for more than 20 years, and it's been my experience that most businesses could stand some improvement in both their inside reality and their outside perception. But for some reason, they struggle the most with their outside perception. In other words, they've got great businesses. Most of them offer exceptional value. They have a good inside reality. But with all the competition that exists, they have a major problem differentiating themselves from the rest of their marketplace. They're simply not getting the value of their business across to those on the outside looking in. What about you? What's your outside perception? Go grab your marketing. Look at your ads. Take a look at your website. Is it instantly obvious, specifically and quantifiably, what makes you better and unique and different? Do you show your prospects how to judge your industry, what factors they need to consider when deciding what to buy, and how you provide greater value than any of your competitors? You'll realize, as these concepts start to sink in, that the crux of most marketing problems, including yours, can be wrapped up in this one simple statement. Most businesses' outside perception is not an accurate reflection of their inside reality. So I'm going to show you why this is happening and what you can do to fix this for your business forever. I told you at the beginning of this presentation that everything you know about marketing is wrong. Now let me clarify what that statement means based on what we've discussed so far. Everything you currently know about marketing does not effectively allow you to accurately and succinctly portray your inside reality to the outside world. And this is a product of decades of being conditioned to do marketing the wrong way. In the very early days of advertising, I'm talking the late 1800s and early 1900s, much of the advertising that existed back then was comparative in nature. Ads wouldn't just say, hey, we're better. They'd say, we're better, and here's exactly why, based on this and that and that and this. On average, they did a pretty good job of building a case and helping prospective buyers understand the important issues in regards to their particular product or service. The result was that the outside perception was generally a pretty good reflection of the company's inside reality. Then, the most significant event in the history of marketing and advertising occurred in 1945. Television was commercially introduced for the first time. Up until then, total national distribution of an advertising message was extremely limited to radio, print advertising in a few magazines, and maybe the Sears catalog. But with the introduction of TV, large advertisers could buy a TV commercial and reach just about every living person in the country for only $4,000 a minute, usually sold in one or two minute blocks. What a bargain, even in 1950s money. But back then, there were only three channels. So demand quickly outstripped the supply of commercials, and prices shot through the roof. In response to the rising costs, the length of commercials shrank down from 2 minutes to 30 seconds. This meant that advertisers had less time to educate us to the important and relevant issues and build a case as to why they were different or better or unique. So instead of attempting to use shorter ads that highlighted their comparative benefits, advertisers changed tactics and started using slogans. That change made it harder and harder for the company's outside perception to actually reflect its inside reality. But remember that marketing's first job is simply to get the prospect's attention. So even running just 30 second ads, getting attention was still not a problem for these advertisers. But then what? That's right. After you grab the prospect's attention, you must next facilitate their decision making process. 
companies and their ad agencies found that this was a lot harder to do in only 30 seconds. But they also found out that they didn't really need to do it because the number of real competitors, that is, the number of competitors that could actually afford to advertise on TV and run ads against their ads was wonderfully few. They could spend a ton of money running 30 second ads and win by default. Now, if there happened to be two or three major competitors jockeying for the same prospects like, you know, Pepsi and Coke, that was fine because there was plenty of business to divide two or three ways. The bottom line is that a company's inside reality and outside perception didn't really have to match up. The lack of a substantial number of choices eliminated this necessity. So the focus for all marketing and advertising shifted to simply getting the prospect's attention. That's when advertising lost its penchant for selling and instead shifted its focus to creativity. The idea now was to get in the consumer's brain with something creative that would stimulate them and cause them to recall the product later on when they needed it. That's when slogans became the de facto marketing standard that is still in use today. 15 minutes can save you 15% or more on car insurance. Breakfast of the champions. Home of the Whopper. How about this one? Is it live or is it? That's right. Memorex. How did you know that? That commercial hasn't run since the 1970s. This new creative approach took over advertising as we know it, and it soon began to filter into all other advertising media, including radio, Google AdWords, newspaper, magazines, billboards, yellow pages, websites, you name it. Once this new creative message was in place, the big companies opened up their checkbooks, spent lots of money, and basically gave people no other option but to remember their message. After hearing, things go better with Coke, for the 8,000th time, you're going to remember it whether you want to or not. We call this the C and R advertising. C for creativity and R for repetition. Create an ad that is usual, that is unusual, weird, shocking, funny, emotional, and so on. Spend a billion dollars running that ad about a million times and then haul your dough down to the bank. We call this the era of the brand builders. And in the 1950s, 60s, 60s, and even into the 70s, it was a no-brainer formula for market dominance for the companies with the financial wherewithal to pull this off. And that's when it happened ad agencies started running this formula for all of their other clients, even the ones that were smaller and didn't have deep pockets. Business schools started teaching marketing and advertising based on these methods that were being successfully implemented by the largest companies in the world and churning out graduates who only knew one way to do marketing. Brand builder marketing and advertising became the de facto standard for how you do it. And after a few years, no one even questioned the formula, which brings us to the crux of the problem. All of us alive today, with no exceptions, grew up in an era where almost all of the advertising you've ever seen or heard is a product of the era of the brand builders. Over time, we've all become conditioned as to what constitutes a good advertisement. We learned the fundamental pattern for what to put into a commercial. We learned about slogans and jingles and being funny. We learned that in marketing and advertising, the outside perception no longer has to reflect the inside reality. Let me repeat what I said at the very beginning of this presentation. Everything you know about marketing is wrong, and now you know why. And as a result of this new breed of advertising, jargon has now started to dominate all marketing and advertising. Think of jargon as words or phrases that are drearily commonplace and predictable, that lack power to evoke interest through overuse or repetition, and that are nevertheless stated as if they were original or significant. In advertising, you see and hear jargon all the time. Since businesses only have 30 seconds to try to convey what makes them special, they lump everything into jargon such as largest selection, most professional, lowest prices, highest quality, best service, fastest, most convenient, largest in the state, more honest, we're the expert, we specialize, works harder, gets the job done right the first time, and been in business for 4,000 years. Now listen. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be those kinds of things. Those actually make up the foundation you want to use to build your inside reality on. But consider this. If my marketing says that I offer high quality and great service, isn't that drearily commonplace and predictable? Doesn't it lack power to evoke interest through overuse and repetition? Isn't it nevertheless stated as though it were original or significant? Does my inside reality, what really makes me good at what I do, does that really shine through? Can you tell specifically what makes me valuable to the marketplace when I say highest quality or best service? See, you simply can't describe, demonstrate, exhibit, reveal, or display your inside reality using jargon. It's impossible. And unfortunately, the end result is an outside perception that you're no different than anyone else. There's absolutely no distinction, no separation, and no differentiation. None. You just flat out can't make your inside reality and outside perception match up when you use jargon like this. In fact, let me give you several ways you can easily and quickly evaluate your own marketing to see if you're getting caught up in the jargon trap. 
Jargon evaluation number one is what we call, well, I would hope so. When you make a claim, don't think about it in terms of the words coming out of your mouth. Think about it in terms of the words entering your prospect's ears. This will enable you to realize just how absurd most jargon sounds. Look at the messaging in your marketing and then ask yourself if the prospect's immediate response might be, well, I would hope so. Let me give you an example. I recently saw a TV ad for a remodeling company. Throughout the ad, they continuously emphasized the fact that their work was of the highest quality. It was fairly priced and they guaranteed 100% satisfaction. Well, I would hope so. Would you hire any remodeler who didn't provide all of those as a standard part of their service? Of course not. This is all jargon. Drearily commonplace, lacks power to evoke interest through overuse and repetition. How about this one from a consulting company? Our training leads to change. We increase the productivity, performance, and profit of your company. Well, I would hope so. Does anyone hire a consultant for any other reason than to do those things? Most ads today are nothing more than a jargon fest. Does this jargon tell you anything about these companies inside reality? What else would you expect them to say? Everyone's always going to say wonderful things about their company if they can get away with it. The problem is that if your company has an exceptional inside reality and you're using the same jargon as everyone else, then the outside perception is that you're all the same. And that's when prospects default to the company offering the lowest price. Price now becomes the only determining factor. When you use this simple evaluation, just ask yourself openly and honestly why anyone would choose you over your competition. Then evaluate your answer against the, well, I would hope so, evaluation. And finally, check out all of your advertising and marketing materials, including your website. Do they pass the, well, I would hope so, evaluation, or are they all chock full of jargon? If they fail, then you need to make changes. Let me provide you with a second evaluation technique. It's called, who else can say that? This is a similar to the first evaluation technique, and it's also a product of the era of the brand builders. Pay very close attention to this one. Stop thinking in terms of who else can do what you do. Instead, think in terms of who else can say what you say. Because the answer, unfortunately, is usually anybody and everybody can say what you say. I know of a kitchen remodeler that ran by far the most impressive remodeling company in his community. Every member of his crew had at least 15 years of remodeling experience. They were all certified subcontractors. They had won multiple industry awards. They were the only kitchen remodeling company that provided not only a full satisfaction guarantee, but also a 10-year material and labor warranty on everything they did. They left the job site every night cleaner than when they first arrived. They also guaranteed they could remodel any kitchen in no more than five days, half the time of their competitors. This, of course, meant far less disruption and inconvenience to the homeowner. In short, their inside reality was literally second to none. But they had a huge marketing problem. Their marketing looked virtually identical to all of their far less worthy competitors. Their marketing said things like certified subcontractors, guaranteed satisfaction, and then a long laundry list of the work they performed, such as new cabinets installed, complete kitchen remodeling, and so on. Oh, and get this, they accept Visa and MasterCard. Well, I would hope so. But then ask this question, who else can say that? When the owner of this remodeling company was asked that very question, he got really defensive. He said, there's no other remodeler that can begin to match the work we do. Our subcontractors are far and away the best there is. No one, and I mean no one, can say that, what we say. Understandably, this contractor was extremely passionate and protective when it came to the superior company he had worked so long and hard to develop over the years. So finally, to try to get the point across to him, he was asked to pull up the websites of his five biggest competitors and, and see what all of them were saying on their homepage. Let's just say that his jaw hung open for about two minutes straight before he finally pointed at the screen and said, Oh my gosh, look at this other company's website. I know this guy. He's terrible. But his site says the exact same thing as mine. In fact, I think he copied my site word for word. He looked at the other remodelers and saw that all of their websites were virtually identical to his. So remember, it's not who can do what you do, it's who can say what you say. If your marketing is full of jargon, then sadly that answer is all of your competitors can. Now let me give you one final jargon de detection evaluation. It's called the scratch out write in test. Take a look at your brochure, advertisement, or website. Now, scratch out your name and write in your competitor's name. That's it. If the marketing is still valid, if the website still conveys the same basic message, if there wouldn't need, if there wouldn't need to be any additional changes, then guess what? You just failed this test. This evaluation can be very revealing. Most businesses discover that they run fairly high on the jargon meter. You may find that your inside reality, excellent as it may be, is nowhere to be found in your marketing message. It's all but lost in a sea of jargon and completely invisible to your prospects. Is this making sense to you? Is it evident 
that this might be a problem for you now and a tremendous competitive advantage if you could figure out how to fix this for your own business. So let me show you how to fix this. Let me explain how you can follow a very simple process we call the conversion equation. And when you do, you'll eliminate jargon forever. I'm going to show you how to become a communications powerhouse. Make your outside perception become an excellent reflection of your inside reality and finally begin to get the results from your marketing that you should be getting. The conversion equation has four main components. Let me start with a brief introduction and then I'll go into more detail. The first component of the conversion equation is called interrupt. This is simply the process of getting qualified prospects to pay attention to your marketing. This is often accomplished by affecting the prospect emotionally. Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Unfortunately, it's a lot more difficult to pull this off in real life unless you understand what you're about to, hear, to learn here. The second component is engage. Once the prospect is interrupted, it's critical to give the reader the promise that information is forthcoming that will help the prospect make the best decision possible or, in other words, facilitate their decision-making process. This is also best accomplished on an emotional level. The third component is educate. Once you've interrupted and, and engaged the prospect, you have to give them information that allows them to logically understand how and why you solve that emotional problem. This is accomplished by giving detailed, quantifiable, specific, inside reality revealing information. This turns the corner from an emotional cell, remember you interrupted and engaged them based on emotional hot buttons, to a logical cell. This is easy to do if you just follow this conversion equation. And the fourth and final component of the conversion equation is the offer. Now, the prospect has been interrupted based on problems that are important to them emotionally, engaged by the promise of a solution to that emotional problem, and they've examined the educational information that makes your solution to that emotional problem real and believable. So the last step for you to give that prospect a low or better yet no risk way to them to take the next step to the sales process. This can be accomplished by offering a free marketing tool such as a report, a brochure, a seminar, an audio, a video, a webinar or something similar that educates them even more. So the prospect feels uh, in complete control of the decision making process. This conversion equation follows the formula for what marketing is supposed to do in the first place. In fact, at this point, we can simply say that marketing's job is to interrupt, engage, educate, and offer. Remember earlier we discussed that if you want to know why Jane Doe buys what Jane Doe buys, you've got to see the world through Jane Doe's eyes, right? Well, I would submit to you that if you want to know what Jane Doe sees, you'd better first understand how Jane Doe's brain works and how, the pro how it processes information and makes decisions. To understand this process, there are three major concepts that I need to teach you. Three concepts that no one else in the world of marketing understands, but three concepts that will make all the difference in the world in your marketing's, ex uh, marketing's effectiveness and, more importantly, in your company's profitability. The three things you need to know about Jane Doe's brain are downtime, uptime, and the reticular activation system, also known as the reticular activator. Let's begin by discussing that first concept called downtime. As simply put, this is the hypnotic state of running automatic patterns that allows your brain to perform habitual tasks without any conscious thought. You do this all the time. For instance, have you ever driven to work and when you got there, you don't remember making the trip? That's downtime. This occurs because driving to work is an habitual pattern that you run so frequently that you don't have to consciously think about it. Have you ever stepped out of the shower and couldn't remember if you shampooed your hair or not? Your brain performs all of these daily routine functions with no conscious thought. Now, here's what downtime means in marketing terms. People see and hear ads with their eyes and ears, but they don't notice them on a conscious level. If you open a newspaper, you'll be looking at maybe 70% ads and only 30% bona fide news articles. But because the ads are only seen on a downtime level, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, you won't consciously notice them at all. All you consciously see in the, is the news, which is uh, what you were there for in the first place. The second concept is what's known as uptime. This is the brain state of alertness and active engagement. It's like when you're driving on the freeway in a heavy thunderstorm, your hands firmly gripped on the wheel at the 10 and 2 o'clock positions, and your pupils are as big as saucers. You're sensitive and responsive to everything around you. You're in uptime when you're watching a horror movie, or you hear the music building uh, to a crescendo in anticipating something scary to happen. You can think of uptime as your brain going on alert mode, but here's what uptime means when it comes to your marketing. When your prospect is in uptime mode, they consciously notice your ad or marketing piece, and they're open to your suggestions and solutions. Something captures their attention and compels them to keep paying attention. The key to marketing is to get your prospect out of downtime and into uptime. We want to shake them out of their natural subconscious haze, where they never see your ad or marketing piece, and into uptime, where they are fully conscious and aware of what you're trying to communicate to them. Once you understand how to do this, you'll have the ability to make a fortune with your marketing. But to completely grasp this model, you've got to learn the third major concept about how Jane Doe's brain works, which is called the reticular activator. The reticular activator is the part of your brain that's on the lookout 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, even when you're asleep. 
It constantly scans the environment, looking for things that fall into any of these three categories. Things that are familiar, things that are unusual, and things that are problematic. When the brain detects any of these three categories on a subconscious level, it sends a message over to the conscious side of the brain and says, Hey, wake up! There's something here you need to pay attention to! And by the way, whatever those familiar, unusual, or problematic things are, we call them activators. In short, your brain, on a subconscious level, is constantly on the lookout for activators. It's searching for things that are familiar, things that are unusual, and things that are problematic. In other words, things that demand a conscious response. Whenever it finds one, it pokes your conscious brain and snaps it out of downtime sleep mode uh, and into uptime alert mode. Now let me give you an example of the raw power of your own reticular activator. And please, don't get mad at me for what I'm about to do to you. But I'm going to permanently embed this example directly into your reticular activation system. And I guarantee that you will remember this for the remainder of your life on this planet. Seriously, here we go. I'm certain that at some point over the just past several weeks, you have glimpsed a FedEx truck making its deliveries. FedEx has been in business since June 18, 1971. And that's a lot of years those trucks have been driving around town. So let me ask you a question. How many times have you seen those FedEx trucks? Over the 40 plus years they have been in business, I would wager to say that you have seen their trucks a minimum of about a thousand times. So here's question number two. Have you ever seen the hidden message within the FedEx logo? Yes, that's a serious question. Did you know that there is a hidden message within every FedEx logo? If you're saying right now, that's impossible. You've seen those that logo thousands of times and you certainly would have noticed a message in there at some point in time, then join the crowd. 99% of the population have never seen that hidden message. Ready for me to tell you where it is? Next time you see a FedEx logo, look between the E and X in FedEx. You will see an arrow pointing to the right. It's as plain as day, and yet very few people have ever detected it over these years. And guess what? That logo was specifically designed that way from the start. It isn't just something that happened by coincidence when the designer created it. Almost no one sees it. But guess what? You will now see it every single time you look at that logo. Why? Because now that I have drawn your attention to it, coupled with the fact that you had no idea it was there before, the next step, the next time you see that arrow, your brain will perceive it to be unusual. And that automatically triggers your reticular activator. Remember, things that are familiar, unusual, or problematic poke your brain and make it pay attention through your reticular activator. But guess what's going to happen next? Now that you know that arrow is there, Every time you see that FedEx logo, your brain will immediately seek out that arrow. And as you observe it over and over, the arrow will move from being unusual to being familiar. And in both of those cases, guess what, guess what else happens? You will only notice the arrow for a second or two because your brain activates when it sees it, moving you from downtime into uptime. But since the arrow isn't really relevant or important to you, your brain quickly reverts back to downtime. Now, so what does this all have to do with marketing? The short answer is everything. Understanding what wakes people up so they pay attention is what's going to get our marketing message past the interrupt stage and onto the engage stage. And when we engage your prospect, we've just increased our chances of selling to the people you're trying to engage by 1000%. This is going to solve the problem that every other marketer hasn't been able to figure out, which is, which is not just getting them interrupted, but also getting them engaged. Not just finding any old activator, but finding the right activator. Any idiot can simply interrupt people. In fact, that's actually very easy to do. The so-called marketing gurus over on Madison Avenue in New York do it all the time. Those guys and gals prefer to use activators that are based on things that are familiar and unusual because they're the easiest to pull off. Have you ever noticed how many different kinds of animals you see in advertising? That's because animals are familiar and likable. And the idea is that those animals will interrupt you by poking your conscious brain when they're detected by your reticular activator. Affleck has the duck, Geico has the gecko, and Coke has its polar bears. You constantly see dancing elephants, talking dogs, and finicky cats. All of these animals have good interim value based on their familiarity. That's also the major reason that big advertisers use celebrities. Familiarity. And what about activators based on unusual things? Well, that's what creativity is all about. Creativity's main purpose in advertising is to dream up something so weird, so strange, so shocking, so unusual that it'll snap you out of downtime and into uptime, otherwise known as interrupt. But here's the key. Here's what no one else seems to understand, and what just may be the most important thing you'll learn in this presentation. Once the brain is activated, once it's been broken out of downtime and into uptime alert mode, it wants to be engaged. So it immediately and subconsciously searches for additional clarifying information. 
The brain wants to know, hey, what's this all about? How does this affect me? Do I need to do anything about this? Literally, on a subconscious level, the brain goes on a fact-finding mission. The bottom line is, the brain wants to know, how is this important and relevant to me? Should I allocate any conscious bandwidth to this? So it searches for additional facts. If it finds them, it becomes engaged. If not, it will quickly revert back to downtime. We call these important relevant issues hot buttons. If you're a golf fan and your reticular activator detects Tiger Woods uh, on TV, it notices that on a conscious level because Tiger Woods is familiar. Now, he's an activator. Then your brain immediately asks, hey, what's Tiger Woods doing driving a Buick? Is there anything here that's relevant or important to me? Or in other words, is this a hot button issue for me at this point in my life? What typically happens is your brain determines that Buick is not important or relevant to you. It doesn't do anything to solve any of your problems and therefore is not a hot button. And so your brain immediately reverts back into downtime. Let me be crystal clear here. An activator is something that snaps a person from downtime to uptime. And it's based on something that's familiar, unusual, or problematic. But an activator can also be classified as a hot button if, and only if, it's based on something that's important and relevant to your prospect. Your best bet to successfully interrupt and engage your target market is to identify problems, frustrations, uncertainties, and annoyances your prospects have, and then address them in your marketing. Their pain, in most cases, is their hot button. And please don't think this is some form of manipulation. All we're doing here is tapping into the problems that your prospects already have. We're not trying to make manufacture a crisis for them. We're merely poking their problems and pointing out these problems so that their reticular activator notices and brings us onto their active radar screen. Now, here's the key point in all of this, and one that none of the big ad agencies understand, but one that you need to know in order to make this all work for you. The activators that are used to interrupt the prospect must be based on a relevant hot button. If not, the prospect will momentarily be interrupted, but will quickly revert from uptime back into downtime. This is what we call false uptime. Have you ever heard someone call out your name in a crowded room? That immediately interrupts you because your name is familiar. But when you turn around to see who it was that was calling you, you realize, oops, they were actually calling out to someone else with my name. Your name is an activator, but because in that situation your name wasn't important or relevant to you, it didn't engage you. You quickly reverted back, right back to downtime. That's what we call false uptime. Remember what I just said about the FedEx logo? Now that you know the arrow is there, every time you see it, your brain will immediately seek it out because it's unusual. But the more often you see it, that arrow shifts from being unusual to being familiar. Then you will only notice it for a second or two. And then your brain quickly reverts back into downtime because the arrow isn't relevant or important to you. This happens in marketing and advertising all the time. Most marketing interrupts, but it doesn't engage. Just like Tiger Woods and Buick. He's famous and you like golf, so it captures your attention. It interrupts you. But when you find out that it's not based on anything that's important to you, when there's nothing relevant, nothing that solves some problem that you have, you quickly revert to downtime. This is one of the things that almost no one understands. And one of the main reasons everything you ever learned about marketing is wrong. You've been conditioned to believe that as long as you've interrupted the prospect, that's it. That's good enough. The job is done. But you have to realize that if you only interrupt the prospect, that's only one-fourth of the conversion equation. You've got to include all four components. Interrupt, engage, educate, and offer to get the maximum result from your marketing and advertising. Now, when it comes to actually writing the marketing, we typically like to portray the hot buttons in the form of headlines. The headline is the first opportunity you have to interrupt Jane Doe. You've got maybe one to three seconds max to interrupt the prospect. So you'd better make sure that that headline has activators in it and that those activators are based on things that are important and relevant to that prospect. Remember, hot buttons, words and phrases that describe problems or frustrations that the prospect is feeling so that their reticular activator latches onto them and snaps them into uptime. In print advertising, magazines, newspapers, yellow pages, and so forth, the form of the headline is obvious. In radio, the headline is the first sentence they hear. On Google AdWords, it's the first bit of text they read. On television, it's the first thing they see and hear. And in brochures, business cards, other marketing collateral, and your company's website, it's the first thing they see. Let me give you two quick examples. First, for a daycare, and second, for a child psychologist who works with kids with behavioral problems. When I ask most daycare providers why parents should choose them instead of the 17 other daycares, they almost always give me some boring answers. High quality, attention to detail, we supervise our staff better, we're honest, we've taken care of more than 200 kids, and so on. Nothing but jargon. Unfortunately, this exact same jargon shows up in boring, ineffective headlines. For instance, when I looked at the marketing of various daycares, they said things like this. Safe, nurturing, and creative environment. 
Optimize your child's development. Acclaimed by thousands of parents. Accredited by industry professionals. A leader in early childhood care and education. Those were all real headlines from real ads. Jargon and more jargon. But note this as well. These headlines all speak to the daycare, not to the prospect. You could place the word we in front of all that jargon and it would fit perfectly. We optimize your children's development. We're acclaimed by thousands of parents. We're accredited by industry professionals. Prospects don't care about the daycare. They care about themselves and their kids. None of those headlines address the problems or concerns of the parents, do they? If you really want to interrupt John and Jane Doe, you've got to use much more powerful language than that to get them to respond on an emotional level. How about this headline to effectively communicate the concept of a safe, nurturing, and creative environment? Ever felt like your daycare treated your child like a number instead of a little person? Or how about this one, to convey being a leader in early childhood care and education? Is your daycare's idea of good educational curriculum watching Barney on TV? Or this one, introducing a daycare center that doesn't consider mac and cheese to be one of the four major food groups. All three of these headlines work in tandem with close-up pictures that work to reinforce this powerful and compelling message. That headline that said, ever felt like your daycare treated your child like a number instead of a little person? Next to it is a four-year-old child sitting in the corner with his head buried in his hands crying. Talk about powerful, emotional, and compelling. Talk about interrupting. See how these headlines speak to the issues of the prospect instead of the daycare? See how they reflect a the fanatical attention to detail that is the foundation of this daycare's inside reality? Of course you do, because it's obvious. Now, what about the child psychologist who works with kids with behavioral problems? Most of these types of professionals say things like, we offer parenting advice and resources. We can help you get your child under control. Learn the secrets of well-behaved children. As a parent with an out-of-control child, why would I want to know the secrets to well-behaved children? See what I mean when I say no one is getting it? That everything you know about marketing is wrong. If you have a child that embarrasses you in public, that is basically uncontrollable and unmanageable, then aren't you desperate for a solution for that behavior? So what if the child psychologist used this headline? Are you sick and tired of the yelling, screaming, and belligerent attitude of your child? Doesn't that immediate address, immediately address the conversation going on in the heads of these parents? Won't that headline immediately interrupt them and knock them out of downtime and into uptime? Of course it will. Consider the example of a moving company. Uh, most movers, ads, and websites have headlines that say something brilliant like, Moving? Most of them have their company name for the headline along the top of their website and marketing material. Or, Local and Long Distance. Why in the world would you ever say something like that? However, by changing their marketing so it followed the conversion equation, their new ad and web copy pulled an astounding 12 times more than their original ad. They went from averaging just 70 calls per month to 955 calls. And their convers conversion rate skyrocketed from 16% to 68%. Let me put this another way. This moving company, just by changing what their ad said, went from generating 11 sales per month to a whopping 649 sales per month. Their new ad generated so much new business, they had to partner with four of their competitors to help them handle the demand of their services. Oh, and by the way, those same four competitors bought out that moving company nine months later for $2 million, all due to following the conversion equation in their marketing. So what exactly was it that generated these fantastic results? Well, their new ad and website featured a headline that said this, last year, over 4,350 complaints and lawsuits were filed against moving companies in Dallas. Got your attention? You bet, because it hits on the prospect's hot buttons of uncertainty and problems that might arise when they move. Then they go on to describe what to look for and what to watch out for when moving. It educates the prospects as to what standards they should use to find the best value when hiring a moving company. Okay, to wrap up this discussion about Interrupt Engage, let me address the topic of Engage specifically just for a moment. To successfully engage, all you have to do is use a headline or a subheadline that promises the reader that if they will keep reading or listening to the ad, they, that they will get information that will facilitate uh, their making their best decision possible. Not sales information, not here's how great we are information, but rather bona fide decision facilitating information. Sometimes the headline itself will engage, but more frequently it's a subheadline that makes the promise to educate and therefore engages. Let's go back to the daycare ad and continue that example. Remember the one that the, had the headline that said, Ever felt like your daycare treated your child like a number instead of a little person? The follow-up, engaged subheadline would simply say, How to ensure your child gets personal, loving, caring, one-on-one -on -one attention at daycare. Or the headline that said, Is your daycare's idea of good educational curriculum watching Barney on TV? The follow-up headline that engages says, How would you like your child to be reading at a first-grade level before starting kindergarten? 
In both cases, these subheadlines clarify the first headline and let the reader know that if they keep reading the ad, they can expect to find specific details regarding each of these major hot button issues. In short, these subheadlines engage. The child psychologist that used the headline, Are you sick and tired of the yelling, screaming, and belligerent attitude of your child? His subheadline said this, Now you can discover the secrets to controlling your child and instantly restore peace and quiet in your home. Show me just one parent experiencing the, those sort of behavioral from their own child who wouldn't immediately respond to this ad. The moving ad, remember, they had the headline, last year over 4,350 complaints and lawsuits were filed against moving companies in Dallas. It had a subheadline that reads as follows. Ask these 15 questions to make sure that your moving company's policies, procedures, and standards will protect you from an unpleasant moving experience. So what do you think you might find if you decide to keep reading the rest of this ad or website? That's right, 15 things to be aware of and to look for when choosing a mover. The subheadline engages the reader to continue reading to find out the decision facilitating information. And that brings us to the third and fourth components of the conversion equation, educate and offer. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that every marketing piece should contain a risk-lowering offer to encourage the prospect to take the next step, and that offer should generally be to receive additional information, or in other words, to further educate the prospect and to build your case. Now, here's the real key to success in marketing. The right offer allows you to capture a large percentage of all future buyers in addition to those looking to buy right now. And there's an educational process that the prospect goes through from the moment they begin thinking about buying your product or service to the point where they actually complete the purchase. Most marketing only caters to those now buyers uh, who will be making a purchase decision in the very near future and does nothing or very little to educate those who are just thinking about it right now, but who might buy later. Here's the problem with that. At any given moment, the number of prospects who are ready to buy right now represents no more than 1 to maybe 5% of all those who are ultimately going to buy what you sell. You've got 95 to 99% of your prospects who are in thinking about it and gathering information mode. But when they're attempting to gather information, you don't give it to them. This is where the fourth component of the conversion equation becomes absolutely huge. Your offer gives you the opportunity to provide additional educational information to the gathering information mode prospects and in the process capture valuable information about who these people are so that you can proactively market to them on an ongoing basis. This allows you to take control of your target market. The daycare that we've been talking about makes a perfect example of this. How many of these parents that see that ad for daycare remember the one that says, Ever felt like your daycare treated your child like a number instead of a little person? Or the one that said, Is your daycare's idea of a good educational curriculum watching Barney on TV? Remember those? How many of those readers do you think are ready and waiting to relocate their kid from their current daycare to this daycare? And were, del and were relieved to see this ad so they could finally make the switch? My guess, maybe 1% maximum are now buyers. But because the headline, subheadline, and images are so powerful, because they do such a good job of interrupting and engaging, a lot more parents who are not ready to buy right this minute are going to see those ads, pay attention, and be interested. These powerful ads could easily compel as many as 10, 15, or even 25% of the parents who read these ads to seriously contemplate changing daycare services. But if the ads only offer is the typical one that most daycares put in their ads, call for a free consultation, then none of those future buyers are going to call. Why would they? If you're not ready to make a change, why on earth would you call now for a free consultation? You wouldn't. Furthermore, the ad itself is relatively limited in size. The daycare can't possibly cram their entire case with all of its associated evidence right there in the ad. It, won't, it just won't fit. This is why we would recommend that the daycare provide what we call an informational offer. What if they offered everyone who calls a free report titled 10 Things Your Daycare May Not Tell You? This report uncovers the 10 critical areas all parents must know and investigate before they place their kids with anyone offering daycare services. This revealing report compares the 17 most popular area daycares against each other in all 10 of these areas, saving the parents their time, effort, and energy when making that all-important decision as to who will watch their child. But here's the really neat part of having this type of offer when the parents do call in or go online to request the free report. The daycare can now capture the prospect's contact information and proactively market to them now until forever. Then the daycare could set up what we call a drip campaign to consistently and repetitiously follow up with these interested parents and keep providing them with additional decision-making information until they finally become ready to buy. Depending on what you sell and the specific situation, there are actually eight different types of informational offers that we create and offer your prospects. And if we want to dominate your marketplace, we've got to get your offers right as well. Hopefully this is all coming together for you now. 
Interrupt, engage, educate, and offer make up the conversion equation. And that equation is literally the backbone of all the incredibly successful marketing campaigns we've ever put together. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. You can probably tell from the depth of information in this presentation that we have a bona fide step-by-step -step uh, system that helps business owners just like you become financially free using superior marketing that makes your phone ring. Remember earlier I said that our system works for big Fortune 500 kinds of companies? Well, our passion doesn't lie with helping huge and soulless corporations. Our passion is for you, the small business owner who has to scrape, fight, and battle every day just to earn a living. I'm offering our system to you as a way to reach the ultimate pinnacle of life, financial freedom for you and your family, along with the ability to do whatever you want with your time and money. After all, you more than likely started your business because you have a true passion yourself for what you do. But when marketing is ineffective, owning your own business can become no more than working a poorly paying job. Compelling and successful marketing can provide you with the financial freedom to pursue your real and true ambitions in life. I believe that everybody has a cause, a cause that can be more fully pursued and supported when you're financially independent. Let us help you reach that goal. We have the tools, resources, and support to help you accomplish this in record time. All we ask is that you give us a chance to show you how we can help you, and we'll do it for free.